afternoon, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Hey, Saints, how are y'all doing? We are doing fine. We are doing great. God is good. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise Him for all He is doing and has done. Will do. However you want to phrase God continuing to work in our lives, you use that phrase. We are we are in such a spirit of gratitude here that we, we're without really words except for thank you and glory to God and thank you, Lord. Um, but let me tell you, our God is big enough to handle whatever situation you may think you're facing. You are not facing it alone. None of us are. And you can rest assured that whatever situation you are in or that you are about to go in or that you are coming out of, it is all by God's grace, by his mercy, by his power that we, that you got the outcome that you have, especially according to where we're going today in Romans, if you have been if you have been wondering about God's judgment and how certain it is, then stick around. Don't fast forward. Don't skip this, this broadcast because you'll want to know why it is that we can be certain that God is going to release his judgment on and over his creation. Amen. That is where we are today. We, as you see on your screen, we're in Romans chapter one. We're going to start at verse 24 and we're going to go through chapter two and end at verse four. Amen. Amen. So thank you all for being here. I am your host, Pastor Herb Moffitt. You have tuned into Apostles Desk here at Restoring God's Family Network. You can use the information on your screen right there. Make sure you visit our website. Also, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. Uh, subscribe, turn on your notifications, and then also leave a comment. Let us know how how these broadcasts and the word that God is delivering through this ministry is blessing you or impacting your life. Amen. Amen. So let's pray and then let's get right into his word. So Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, first and foremost, for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that John 6, 3, John 3, 16 was not a lie because you cannot lie. Let every man be alive, but you and your word are true that you love the world so much that you gave your only son as the ultimate sacrifice of atonement and the way to redemption and the truth about your nature and your love for for your creation and the life, the model of the life that we should live. And so, Father, for all those who are under the sound of my voice, Lord, we submit ourselves to the word that you are given. The word that you are given today, Lord, we submit our lives to line up with that word, not going left or right, but making sure that we hold ourselves responsible, that we judge ourselves correctly to ensure that we are in the center of your will for us. So, Lord, as we are going about our lives, we ask that you would not let us turn left or right, that you would arrest us in our steps. We surrender and yield to your spirit, to your Holy Spirit, to stop us in our tracks. And, Lord, we know that your word will not return to you unfinished, nor will you leave us in a state where we are unfinished. You are continuing to always, always, always work your goodness in us, through us, and for us. So, Lord, illuminate this word. Let it shed. We, we open our hearts to you to shed your light. So abroad in our hearts, Lord, that there are and will not be left any remnant of a shadow of doubt about your love for us and your divinity. We thank you, Father, for your 
all-knowing, all-powerful being, and just you being the great I am in our life. Bless you, Father. We love you. Thank you for your sacrifice. And thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood that we shed over our hearts and minds on this day. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So turn with me or just uh, look up on your screen and we will go right into Romans verse one. Not verse one. Chapter one, verse 24. And as it reads there, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, it says, So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserve. My God. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. And they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God, in his justice, will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Amen. Wow. Wow. Now, let just my my spirit, my mind right now is looking at at this. And you saw I had a couple of scriptures highlighted here. Um, but let's let's think and, and recap before here in the first first chapters of, of first chapter of Romans, we see we see how mankind has turned from the knowledge of God, of knowing who he is. And here, here here's an illustration. There was a, a couple, the man and woman, they had been married for, you know, 60 some years. And uh, it was the, the, the wife started having some, men, some some health issues. So they went to the doctor, doctor checked her out um, and the diagnosis came back that you should get your affairs in order because you don't have much more time here. So husband and wife went back home and there was a shoe box that the wife had always had. It was in the closet and for the length of their marriage, the husband was always told, don't worry about what's in that box. Don't worry about that shoe box. You can move everything else around it, but, you know, don't concern yourself with the contents of that box. Well, now was the time and the wife 
said to her husband, go get that shoe box. Let me, uh, let's explore what's in it. So he goes to get the shoe box, opens it up. He sees two yarn dolls and a hundred thousand dollars cash. And he comes back to the wife. He's like, what are you dolls about? And she, she says, well, my mom, when we first got married, she said, don't ever argue back. Just get your crochet kit and your needles and stuff and go make a doll. And so the husband, he's like, wow, this whole time, she's only been ever mad at me and, and disagreeable twice. And so he begins to get weepy, begins, you know, his heart get, begins to palpitate. Guys, you, you know how this goes, right? Wives, you've probably seen your husband or significant other do this. And, and then he's like, wow. So what's the, what's the cash? What is that? Oh, the wife says, that's the money I made from all the other dolls that I made. <laughs> so point of that story is, it's just a little, little funny bit, but, but think about it though. The, the husband thought he knew his wife and he thought he knew the intentions of what the dolls were for. Not really understanding why the money was even there. He thought the shoebox was just something for her. Not understanding that it was something that she was given to do with the emotions that she was, that she was experiencing. Now, if it never had come to the point to where uh, this diagnosis came about, we don't know how it would have came about that he would have gotten this information about this box. But he could have asked. So knowing someone and knowing about them and knowing their intentions and what they're doing is different from seeing the thing that is being created or that was created. Well, this is how we or mankind is described in this first chapter of Romans, where we're looking at the things that God has created. And we're so focused on the creation that we're not really looking at the creator. This is what this is what the Apostle Paul is warning us against. He's warning us against looking at the creation and focusing so much on the creation as opposed to focusing on the creator. And he and he says, um, I mean, I want to bring this back up for you. And so because of our focus on the creation we, we have turned ourselves from God. And now we're left with God doing what he's, what he's always said he would do. For those who are not turning from their wicked ways, those who are not repenting of their sins, he, he leaves them. He leaves them to the things that they that their hearts obviously desire and we can look at second chronicles 7 14 and see that this is exactly what god will do he says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways i will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their lands. Verse 15, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. Now he's talking about the temple, but we know now that our bodies under the new covenant, our bodies are this temple that he's making for himself to dwell in. But if we, if, if we are left to only wanting what our flesh desires. This word hearts here, you can, it can be translated as flesh. It can be translated as, as, as basically anything 
that is not a desire of God's that he has placed in us. And so because we are turning from God and not acknowledging him, he in turn is leaving us to do whatever it is that we want to do. And now remember, and Paul is writing this to, to Romans during his day. But if you just look at verse 26, 26 through uh, 32, we they, it lines up with where society is today, which just says to me that it's a cycle. There is a cycle of turning from God. It's a cycle of, yeah, I see that tree and I see the fish and I see the birds and I see other humans. But I'm going to give more honor to those things that I see rather to the 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 unseen creator who created the things that I'm seeing. Verse 25, they traded the truth about God for a lie. And so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. And listen, saints, God is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. He is worthy of eternal praise. We here were facing uh, a, a short or a, we were facing a crisis. This crisis was one that uh, came out of uh, my own doing. But because of Second Chronicles 7. And understanding that there's a part of that that I must do in order for God to do the part that he does. Well, glory to God, once the conditions on this side were met, he came through. And he came through in such a big way, the enemy was mad, caused some other stuff, but God came through again. But the thing that it revealed is that there is a responsibility on the side of us humans that if neglected, we get left with the shameful desires of our heart. And when we are, we're left with just this animalistic nature. It's, it's, it's the, the spirit of God that indwells on the inside of us is the, what separates us from the birds and the, and, and, and the animals and the trees because we we are we have been made to freely give back praise and worship to God but we're also called and required to judge ourselves and if we judge ourselves according to God's word and his ways and, and, and the order of things that he has set up. And if we put our focus on being grateful to him and gratitude to him and worshipful of him first, then we won't have these other desires because our heart will be desiring the things of God. You know, Philippians Chapter four, four through four through six says it like this. <clears throat> and it says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And now, brothers and sisters, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. That's uh, Philippians 4, 4 through 8. What is true, honorable, right, and pure? 
those are the things that we should be putting our mind on when we are in this time of judging. So it's not just it's not just judging for judging sake. It's putting things in the right, putting ourselves and our thinking in the right frame of mind. All right, let me uh, put this up on the screen for you so you can so you can see it. Take a screenshot of it because you you want to keep this at the we want to keep this at the forefront of our minds. We we don't want to you know as the word also says we look in a mirror and then as soon as we turn away we forget. So we want to keep this at the front of our mind so we can on our mind so we can it can take root in our heart. So when crises come and when crises come we will we'll have something to stand on when things are going our way or we're a little tired and 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 I'll, I'll be the first to admit my countenance is not the best it's, it's, it's not the best if I'm not keeping this on my mind I'm not doing the thing that God has given us the responsibility to do and that is to judge ourselves so let's go back up let's go back to romans here now when god leaves us to ourselves this is how we see society shifting the culture of society shifting to accepting things that are evil for things and, and calling it good and, and there's been argument going on, and, and this is not the broadcast to broadcast to specifically get into that argument on homosexuality. But if you look at verse 26 through 27, it says right here that because God abandoned them to their shameful desires, the women turned against a natural way to have sex. And then the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, did shameful things with other men. And this is sin. And as a result, they suffered. Now, the issue here is the, the, the sin that's being identified here is homosexuality. But if we look at this from God's view, sin is sin. So we can say that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Sin began, people began to sin. Women thought it was okay to sin. Men thought it was okay to sin. And as a result of the sin, the suffering was the penalty. And, and then in verse 29, we see what, what the fruit of this sin is. And it runs down through 31. Lives became full of every wickedness, every sin every greed, every kind of wickedness. Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling. You see it right there on your screen. The fruit of the sin was a life full of wickedness. And we love, as humans, I won't say as believers, but we have a tendency to label things, label ourselves, well, God has identified the labels of those who are turned and left to their own devices. They're backstabbers. Verse 30 lines that out. And it's not even bad enough to be haters of God and proud and boastful and insolent. These when 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 humans are left to our own devices and we're not we're not following the ways of God. We invent new ways. That's how 
see, God created us in his image. And because of that, we have the same ability to create that God does. We can't create whole planets and universes, but we can create a life or a lifestyle. But if we are doing so not according to God's will and not following his way, it's a sinful life. And we will be looking for ways to sin. And like the word says, creating new ways to sin. Even though there's nothing new under the sun, it would be new to us. It would be new to, to the sinner. But if we go on refusing to understand the wrongness of our ways, continuing to break promises, to continuing to be heartless, continuing to not be merciful, we're, we're, we're ignorant to the fact that that because of sin, the consequences are death. And I thank God for his mercy. Because, yes, we know that. And yet and still, without a repentant heart and turning from that and turning from those wicked ways we are left with receiving what we deserve. And worse yet, in, in, in Paul's opinion, worse yet, we're encouraging others to live that sinful life. Not us, but those who are doing that. And there may be some things that we, that God is working out with us. We're struggling in some areas. And it could be anything, struggling to honor your word, struggling with promiscuity, struggling with lying, struggling with depression, struggling with uh, just, just, just being all around sad sack. If we are encouraging other people and we can encourage other people just by not changing ourselves. But in order to do that, in order to do that, we must judge ourselves. And we are in error if we are judging other people and not looking at ourselves in, in that same light. Amen. Uh, let's let's turn over. Uh, in math, in um, I think it's in Matthew. Well, I'll just we are told that we must remove the log out of our own eye before we can start looking and trying to pull the speck out of our brother's eye. That means we have a responsibility to be aware of ourselves first. So this word that, that you're receiving is just as much for you as it is for me. Uh, so we are working and we are walking this. We are walking this together because there are areas where God is still working on me and he is doing a marvelous, miraculous work. And it's a quick work, but it's a work that, that must be submitted to. And it's a work that I must submit to. It's a work that you must submit to. We we're all, all of his children are called to submit ourselves unto him. But also to one another. But the judgment is always going to start with us. And the holding responsible is always going to start with us. Otherwise, we are left. We are left with what God is, is giving us. Uh, in the last part of Romans chapter one, but where we want to be and the judgment that we want to receive is down here in chapter two, verse four. We want, we want to see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient 
that God is with us. But we got to we got to be we got to turn from our sin. In order to see that, because that that's what God's kindness is doing, that is what he is. It, it, all of his mercy. All of his mercy is for us to turn. From our wicked ways. You know, if we go back to the Old Testament and look at the laws that he laid out, yes, they were a schoolmaster to teach the children of Israel how to worship and honor him and also to set themselves apart from the, the folks around them that they were uh, to drive out. But it was to teach them about his goodness and kindness and a way for them to continue to receive his goodness and kindness because it went to the scapegoat. There was some type of atonement made by each person for each sin that they committed. Well, thank God we're in the new covenant. And under this covenant, Jesus is that atonement. He is that sacrifice for all the sin that we laid out, that, that, that we put on the screen here. All of that sin comes under the blood of Jesus, comes under his atonement and sacrifice, and it's so freely given. But we do have a condition to meet, and it is confessing our sin, acknowledging the sin, confessing the sin, believing that Jesus came and died to free us from that sin. And then making the quality decision to receive the gift of salvation and Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Accepting him as our Lord and Savior gets us the gift of salvation, gets us access to the Father, gets us access to God's kindness. And so I love how the Apostle Paul phrased this question in the middle of verse 4. Does this mean nothing to you? Does this mean nothing to you that God is wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient? That's why that's why God is a God of second chances. That's why he over and over again, no matter where you drop a pen in his word, you see him over and over again. Redeeming his children after allowing the consequences of their sin, allowing a, what, whatever judgment their actions from their sin brought them. God came back around in his kindness and his mercy and delivered them. And now sent Jesus to do the same thing. And Jesus does it. Over and over again, God forgives over and over again. And we are to do the same. That starts with the responsibility of being responsible for yourself. Correctly seeing your actions and judging them against the word of God. Taking the thought that leads to that action, capturing it. And judging it against the word of God for yourself. And then being repentant and turning back to God and then receiving and being grateful. We have to be grateful to receive this word and, and this forgiveness. It's with a grateful heart that that's one of the things that made David a man after God's own heart was how quickly he acknowledged his sin and turned from it. We can do the same, friends. We can do the same. We can do the same, family. We can turn from our wicked ways. We can acknowledge that our ways are in error. And we can acknowledge the one the one creator God, the one owner God, the one source God. I love the way I heard that last week. 
we can acknowledge him in all of his ways and turn from our sin and then receive that goodness, receive that kindness, receive that patient God. Because he is. He is so patient. And so from this, understand that overall, we must judge ourselves and not make any excuse for it. But judging ourselves in the same way that we judge others, we judge ourselves first. And if in doing that, we will not stay the same. Because think, think about this, and then I'm, I'm closing. You're walking in the park, or you're walking down the street, or in the yard. And you're having a great time. You're enjoying the sunshine. It's bright and sunny. You know, it's it's like, well, here in Texas, that means it's it's bright blue sky. There's no clouds, and it's about 79 to 82 degrees outside with a slight breeze, right? That would be the perfect day. It would just, everything's going great. And then all of a sudden, while you're enjoying all this goodness and greatness, you either step in some dog poo or you step, you, 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 you step on some gum. And so now your walk is tainted. You got some crud on you. You get this crud off, you know, you wash your shoe or, you know, drag it out or, you know, you, you do what you have to do to fix what has just been messed up. But you do it for yourself first, you know, sure, you could be upset at the, 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 the dog parent or owner or responsible person for the dog who wasn't responsible to pick up after the dog or the person who is just irresponsible to just toss gum out on the street thinking somebody else is going to pick it up. We, that's wasted energy to be mad at those people. But you can use that energy to clean that up off your shoe. And then once you do that, continue on because the sky is still blue and clear and sunny. The temperature is still about 79, 82 degrees with a slight breeze. The only thing that happened was you stepped in something. But you could step right out of it too. It's the same way with our sin. We're walking along now. Sin is a conscious choice. But just like it's a conscious choice to step in it, it's a conscious choice to step out of it. The great thing about it is we can step out of it with God. We don't have to step out of it by ourselves. But we must be responsible to acknowledge I stepped in it. Lord, help me. Thank you for your help, Lord. Now I'm stepping out of it. And you keep walking and you step in something else or something else happens. Repeat. Ah, Lord, I stepped in it. Ah, I'm responsible. Lord, ah, forgive me. Help me. Help me step out of this and then step out of it. Thank you, Lord, for helping me step out of it. That's. That's how we. That's how we get to God's creative and divine judgment. Because it is ultimately his goodness that leads us to repentance. Amen. Amen. So, Lord, thank you. We are so certain from your word that we are grateful that your judgment is divine that you you already you see the end from now you see the end from the beginning 
and everything in between that, you you align for us to come to a point to where we see and acknowledge and experience your goodness. But you're a covenant God. And because you are a covenant God, we do have to turn and repent from wickedness and turn our hearts back to you. So, Lord, I thank you that you are you are helping us to be responsible for ourselves. Your word, your word in Timothy says you didn't give us a spirit of fear. But you gave us a spirit of power, love and self-control. And Lord, it's the spirit of self-control that I'm, I'm grateful for. And I thank you, Lord, that you are showing us how to walk out this spirit, walk in this spirit of self-control. And it starts with being responsible, responsible for our thought life, responsible for our countenance, our emotional state, our heart state, our word, how we honor that word, how we honor this temple, our body that you've given us, that you made so you can indwell with us. And so, Lord, I thank you. And by in, in the name of Jesus, I just release spirit of self-control over all those who are who are thinking and who are reaching out to you and who are who are looking to you to help them and deliver them. And deliver many times from ourselves, from themselves. So, Lord, thank you again because it's only by the shed blood of Jesus that we even have the ability and the right, the access, the privilege to come to you in times when we have stepped in it and can come to you. And because of your goodness, you help us step out of it. So no matter what the sin is, we can bring it to you, Lord, and you have a way of helping us and delivering us and helping us step out of it. Thank you for being gracious and merciful and patient and kind and tolerant of us, Lord, while we are in error of not acknowledging you. Thank you, Father, that you are helping us learn how to judge ourselves and to judge ourselves correctly. So during this time, Father, this week, while we are unpacking what you have taught us and we're walking it out with fear and trembling, Lord, we fear you and we fear you. We reverence you to please you, to please you, Lord. Help us to stay pleasing to you. And you send your son, Jesus' name, that we give you all thanks all glory, all honor, and all of our praise. Amen and amen. Well, family, love y'all so much. Thank y'all for being here with us. Uh, next week, we will be continuing on in Romans. And until the Lord says the same uh, and the creek don't rise, we will be back here next Sunday, same time. Thank you so much again. Hit that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, turn on your notifications so you can be here with us and leave a comment letting us know how God is blessing you through this word. Amen. Amen. Love y'all and we will see y'all next week.